Hi everyone, Florence Theriault here back again, determined to smile more today, and I will smile by talking to you first of all about the title of our upcoming auction, which is My Shadow But Dances Around Me. Now, I was so excited when I found this for an auction title because it comes from an 8th century Chinese poet, Li Bao. And the whole poem reads like this, or not the whole poem, but the beginning. Though the poor moon can't drink, and my shadow but dances around me, we're all friends tonight, the drinker, the moon, and the shadow. And I thought that kind of encapsulates how dull people gather their things around them, their friends around them, the whole environment around them, and they become as one. It's like a community. I thought, okay, this is a great auction title until someone else pointed out that the word but can be spelled two different ways. And we've had all sorts of wonderful jokes about, about my shadow butt dances around me. Nevertheless, it's all in fun and let's have a good time and talk about some of these dolls that come from some wonderful collections of people that I've worked with over the years, helping them develop and work uh, to build their collections. And they've gone in so many different directions and themes of the type they want, but to me that was also part of the title, that they all came together as a community of collectors who loved these historical objects from our past. I decided to, however, focus on my videos from this auction on the poupées, of which there are so many in this auction, that I thought this is an incredible opportunity to try to bring them all together and to talk to you about some of the uh, many aspects of them that you can consider. One of the things that I have done here, and I do want to point it to your attention, I'll, point, I'll show them all to you later, is I have some books. Now I know that you're all, and I'm doing the video online, so clearly I'm in that funnel too, but let's not forget books. Some of the research that has been done on these dolls can only be found in books, and I'm gonna show you some later that I think are so terribly important that if you should try to acquire them for your library because you will not find this information online, and it's, it's important information that we need to preserve. The French poupée, let's talk about it. The French poupée basically defines the doll as a lady. It defines the doll as a lady that was presented in fashion, was presented in the shape, in the style of a body of a lady. Not necessarily a developed body, but certainly the height and the proportion of the head to the body. That was really, really always important to have. What, what is important about the French poupée is something that happened in the mid-1800s, and it's called the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that time, most of the dolls that were being made that were poupées or lady dolls were kind of made for the upper crust. They were made for wealthy people. They were made of carved wood or very, very fine materials, and they weren't really available to the majority of the population. Um, there were some exceptions, and one of the things of an early French poupée, and I want you to look at this wonderful doll, because she is made of paper mache and the paper mache was made actually by a German gentleman who emigrated to France and opened up a paper mache factory there. And he moved away from making the rounded faces of the child dolls that had been made in Germany to be making this elegant slender bodied face or slender um, shaped face of a lady. And I wanted you to see her, and when I turned her around, I hope I'll turn her again, and you can have a chance to see this coif she's making. These early French paper machés, um, um, Mr. Voigt was the German gentleman I was speaking of, came in with kid bodies, which developed into the kid leather bodies of the, French, of the bisqueted poupées later on. But what was significant at the time was that the costumes were not designed to be taken off. In many cases, they were actually stitched right onto the body and couldn't be taken off unless they were to be destroyed. Um, but in other cases, they were so tight that certainly the concept of a child playing with this doll, dressing and undressing it, it, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, and you can see how fitted this doll is. So that was the beginning of the French poupée for regular population. And let me just turn it again. So you can see this wonderful uh, beadwork that's formed on this coif she's wearing. It's absolutely extraordinary. You also have the beginning, when I turn it around again, you're going to see of the enamel eyes. 
And these are about as simple as you can be. They're like black specks, black enamel specks, but they are glass and they are in her head. So what happened? How did everything change? Well, a couple things changed and one of the, we have a couple um, doll makers that, that are like pivotal, they're champions, they're, they're the stars and they mark the starting point of the French poupée made of bisque or porcelain. There was earlier Jacob Petit who was actually made little, what were known as bimba lotteries or trinkets uh, of, uh, made out of porcelain for your parlor or your salon. And then he decided he'd make a doll head and that kind of caught people's fancy and it caught the fancy of a young woman, Adelaide Hooray, who went to uh, the Paris Exposition and saw the Jacob Petit heads. And in the meantime, she had been thinking about making a doll. She was very, very interested in making a doll that would be something that a child could actually play with. This was her concept. And she introduced, and it was, I wanna get my dates straight, because these dates are so important on all of these features. In, First of all, let me tell you something. In 1844, the patent laws changed in France. Now this is going to be really important when I'm discussing Adelaide Harade and Leontine Romer who got into this lawsuit together. But in 1844, the French patent laws changed and at that point, there only had to be two requirements to get a patent. One, it had to be something new. And two, very interesting, it had to have industrial character. And what this is tell us, that industrial revolution was in full force in France and they wanted objects that were being made that incorporated new industrial techniques, not handcraft, not sitting in a little studio at home carving or doing something by hand, but something that used various industrial techniques. These were the two criteria to get a patent. Now, the patent was good for five years or 10 years. And this is also important to know when you start to see lawsuits happen later on. The patents that you could get for five years were kind of inexpensive. The 10-year ones were very expensive and you had to pay taxes on them every single year. That's a whole history in itself that would be fascinating for people to get more into. Well, Adelaide Harade came from a family that had been manufacturers of furniture, uh, people-sized furniture, and actually made some doll furniture later on, made out of metal, and so she was very, um, knowledgeable about the whole concept of the industrial process and she wanted to make a doll that children could play with. She was very interested in articulation, in movement, in removing and replacing costumes. All of this type of thing were important to her. Ironically, in doing her patent, she had the possibility of using very various materials, but for history's sake, for preservation's sake, she sadly chose a product that was very um, luxurious and also, to come to find out, fragile. She chose the gutta percha, the gutta percha to make her doll bodies. And that is why so many of them were A, well, easily broken, the bodies, and C, uh, or an even more important, expensive. This was a very, very expensive material. And that is one of the things that has made the Hooray doll not selling well at the time, even though it won many awards, but also not found today because not that many were made. In this auction, we have three of the Hooray dolls that we're going to show you that are being offered. This is such a treat to be able to have this many Hooray dolls in one time. And things that are very, very important that I do want to point out to you. We have here, number one, the Hooray doll with her original deposed gutta percha body. Uh, very, very, um, if you picked it up, you could pick it up and hold it. The first thing that you would say is, oh, it would almost fly out of your hands because it's very, very light material. And that's really quite interesting. Um, also the painting of the eyes, and we have an example here in porcelain and another example in bisque. She used, went from both, used both mediums over a period of time. And the eyes are always very distinctive because in the lower part of the eye itself, there's like a decorative glaze that you really don't find on any other doll. And it's a, a very distinctive feature to identify Hooray. Luckily, you're also able to identify them because originally on the breastplate of the doll, she would have a kid collarette 
on the breastplate and would have the stamp because she wanted to prove to everyone that she had won awards for her dolls and so all of her dolls would be marked on the body. Unfortunately, sadly, because many of the original gutta percha bodies do not remain, we do not always find them signed. Now, this is another example of a hooray doll uh, that was made, and this one is made of bisque. They were made with straight shoulder heads or with swivel heads, either one. You could have either. And this one has had the body replaced over time, and so it has an all-wooden articulated body. Many of the um, dolls were sent back to the original uh, hooray establishment in which they would replace them with wooden bodies and others were replaced at other various um, restoration shops in Paris over the years. And so you have to determine if you want to have only the original gutta percha body or if you're happy with a wooden body. What is important that the doll must have a certain proportion and that is a different proportion than the paper mache doll that I just showed you, which was a lady doll. Tall, slender, slender face, slim. We have moved in with Hooray. She said very specifically, this doll represents a child, not a lady, a child. And this is an important thing for collectors to, to grasp today because so many of them think of them as French fashions and immediately assume that they're lady dolls and they're not. It was called Mode Enfantine and all of the costumes that were designed for the dolls were designed to be costumes that would be worn by children of the time period. You can see that their bodies are plumper, they have these full skirts, they're a little bit um, not so tight to the body, and this was a very important feature. And so when you're looking for your Hooray doll, you want to get one of the, um, I call them, they're, they're slightly, they're just slightly shorter, just a fraction, but their faces are round and their body should be round to, to match that and to incorporate it. Now, while um, Adelaide Hooray was moving ahead with her dolls, and this was during the, this was in um, 1850s, there was another woman who became very, very interested in it. And her name was Leontine Romer. And she also, she did so much in the way of patents, of things, because she, she fell into this class if she wanted to do something that needed an industrial design that would have to be created industrially. She had an unfortunate situation, though. Um, I want to tell you this. And um, she did her... Adelaide Hooray, remember, did her first patent in 1851 for her doll body. Now, we don't know, or I don't know, I'm, perhaps someone does and I just don't know, um, how long the patent was for. Was it a five-year patent or was it a 10-year patent or did she renew? That's important. But in 1857, this would be just six years later, was the first Romer patent for her doll. And this was really interesting because, as you can see, we are still in this mode enfantine period. Rounder, childlike face. Definitely not a lady. This is a child. A plumper body. And now we're moving into things like doing the porcelain hands. And she also did a very, very distinctive body and had several body patents. One of them was she incorporated the legs. so. She had a kid body so the doll could sit because she would have strings coming out of the torso that would hook onto a little ridge on the kneecap so the doll could be held in a seating position. And she had um, several um, patents of this nature. But she also made a body of zinc. And that's where she got in trouble. I guess she was selling more successfully than Hooray was. Who knows? I don't know. But all I know is that um, Adelaide Hooray decided to sue Leontine Romer and there was this big lawsuit that it went on and it all revolved around the zinc bodied uh, Romer, not the earlier kid bodied ones, but the zinc bodied Romer. And Hooray won the, the battle and she had to give up these zinc bodied dolls. Although ironically, two years later, she was advertising that she had them, so we don't know what happened. Now, her bodies, really don't look anything like Hooray at all. And I don't know what was going on there that the judge decided to find in favor of Leontine um, or at Adelaide Hooray. Um, ironically, Miss Romer was married to a Russian man and he was the man that the patent was deposed in his name 
But it, when it went to court, the judge began his judgment by saying, now listen, I see that the man had really nothing to do with it, so we're taking him out of the picture, even though the patent was in his name. And he threw all the blame on poor Leontine. So I'm a fan of hers. I think she did some great work and came up with some great designs, and we gotta be praising her a lot more than we have been in the past. And then I'm gonna show you some other dolls. Now while we're showing you as we go along some of the other dolls that fall into the category known as the mode infantine. This is the child period of the French poupée. And it basically lasted from 1855 to about um, 1865, 1867. And that was the mode infantine period. Again, where the doll is des basically designed to be a child. Um, and not a lady. And you can again look at the faces, look at the round faces, look at the plump, shorter bodies. This was what the, what the design was to be. And the whole purpose was again to give the child a plaything, to change the whole concept of a doll so that the, the child would have a companion, a friend. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the French poupée during this period. Remember, the whole lifespan of the French poupée for all practical purposes. Obviously there are, you know, stragglers on either side of this era. But from 1850 to 1880, that's just 30 years. 30 years. That was like a quarter century, but I mean it was it was unbelievable. In 1867, midway through this, it was reported that there were over 200 doll establishments in Paris. Over 200. And they range from everything from uh, luxury stores that were selling items to small uh, ateliers or studios that were assembling dolls. And I want to talk to you about this whole assembly process because that was, it's why it's so difficult to learn about French dolls. If I point out any one of these dolls and I say to you, who made these dolls? Or you ask me who made these dolls? You'll find when you, re you read my catalog description very often, I'm saying French, comma, and then a period like 1865 or 1867 or 1860 because it is virtually impossible to know who made most of these dolls. Now I know that rattles all of you. You don't want that. You want to put a name on something. You just can't do it a good part of the time. And here's why. It was, it was complicated. It wasn't simple. Ahead, my, someone may decide that they're going to promote a doll, that person. They are going to get their head, whether it's porcelain or bisque, and probably from, they may order it from Barrois, who could even have been ordering some of his, who wasn't a firm, it was a firm that just kind of got heads for people, from various porcelain shops around Paris that made other decorative items or objects, and then he would commission 50 doll heads to be made. He might even order some from, from Germany. There were so many uh, possibilities of where heads could come from until, it was not until um, 18, well, I want to get your dates straight because these are important dates for you to absolutely know. Um, Gaultier, Gaultier opened a specific doll firm in 1867. Prior to that, Gaultier was a big porcelain factory in Paris, made all kinds of porcelain things, decorative items, dishes, whatever you want. Sometimes made heads if he was commissioned. But in 1867, he saw an opening and opened a factory only to make doll heads. Keep that in mind. In 1870, Pierre-Francois Jumeau built his porcelain firm for his Jumeau heads. And these were poupées at the time. And that opened in Paris. Other than that, anywhere. They came from anywhere. People would commission and make doll heads. So it is impossible to try to determine who a manufacturer was, even if you find little cryptic initials on things. Very, very difficult. Sometimes you will find a stamp on a body that will say, for example, a, a very good example is Simone. Simone was not a doll maker. Simone was a luxury doll shop in Paris. Sold the finest of dolls from everywhere. And if they, because they wanted to brag about what they sold, much as, a, much as a department store today, for example, might brand a product that they've commissioned from some factory somewhere else in the world, and they put their stamp on it, but they didn't make it. The same is the case with Simone, for example. He did not make the dolls. He would commission them. He would have a head from here, a body from there, a wig from here, eyes from here, costumes from there, and put them all together, and then say, 
his stamp on it, Simone Dahl, but he didn't make it. So we need to stop trying to simplify the French poupée and determine we've got to put a brand name on every one of them. We can't do it. It's time that we grow up. We, we can judge. We can look at these dolls over and over. We can see, is the head and the body correct together? Is the right era? Is the wig correct? Is the costume correct for this doll? And then that's our judgment. Is it beautiful? Do we love it? And try to put a time frame on it and stop trying to actually put a brand name on it. And that's my little rant for today. I'm done with that. So I want to show you some of these because I love these. These are all from this period. From It would rank from like 18, I would say 1858 or 59, more like 1860 to 1865. In this time period, all of these mode infantine dolls, and let's look at the variety. We do have one porcelain girl still represented here. And notice that she has a lovely pink tinting to her complexion because when you compare her with her bisque sisters, you're going to see next to her and look at their complexions one after another. On the far side here, we have the nun. I guess she went in the convent as a child. Um, but she has the palest, palest of complexion. Next to her, you have another girl with a very pale complexion, but she does have nice blushing on the cheeks and the same that you're finding here. But overall, very white complexions. And I want you to be keeping this in mind when you compare it a little bit later with the poupées that were made in like the 1870 to 75 period. You're going to see their complexion changes radically. You're going to see variations in bodies in this time period. We have many examples in this collection because our wonderful collectors really loved wooden bodies. And so many of the poupées that we are presenting here have their wooden bodies and sometimes they have additional to the wooden bodies they will have the bisque arms sometimes they're all wooden well, I'm going to show you some wooden bodies shortly and one of the things and I'll show you some of the things to look for in wooden bodies but you want to also make sure and then you sometimes you have kid bodies you can help to date the dolls for example if you have a poupée with a kid body look at her toes if the toes are separated like like a fingers would be on this hand. If the toes are separated, that's an earlier period, starting about late 1867, 68, 69. They started to stitch the toes as the foot as a one-piece foot. So all of these things can help you date your doll really pretty precisely. I mean, we can really work at a piece and we can try to do all of the elements and help pinpoint it within, certainly within a five-year period, which considering that this is now... Um, going on over a century and a half ago without a lot of documentation, I think that's pretty good just by comparison of one to another. So I hope you've enjoyed those, and I'm going to show you more.